You know, I was never a very good student of physics in high school or of any other subject, frankly. But one thing I know is that um, when an object starts falling, its velocity will increase. The rate of its descent will only accelerate until it hits the ground. And I've noticed a, a similar thing happens with wokeness. Leftism has its own gravitational pull, which ensures that once a person or organization falls into the woke pit, it will tumble towards annihilation at ever-increasing speeds. But also, there really is no ground in this scenario. Leftism is more of a black hole, I guess. You fall endlessly into the darkness until you're ripped apart and the pieces of you disintegrate and become one with the abyss. We're watching this play out right now across our culture. Disney is just one case study, but a rather instructive one. Now, it's true that Disney has been liberal probably since Walt himself died, but they've mostly sort of been orbiting around the black hole, approaching it in a somewhat controlled manner. But then the parental rights bill in Florida came along, prohibiting teachers from talking to five-year-olds about their sexuality. Uh, Disney facing pressure from a small cluster of LGBT, LGBT extremists in their organization had to make a choice. They could try to remain neutral, which would keep them in orbit around the black hole of wokeness, or they could actively push back against the LGBT militants, which was never going to happen. But if they did, it would actually move them farther away from that black hole, or they could cave to the radical gay factions and come out fully in favor of teaching seven-year-olds about transgenderism and gender fluidity. They, of course, chose the latter option, which meant diving right into the hole. And now they're in the midst of an ideological freefall. This is what LGBT activists want. They don't want you orbiting around the perimeter. They insist that you surrender to their demands and reorganize your whole life or your whole organization or both in whatever way they require. So investigative journalist Chris Ruffo has obtained footage that shows just how rapid this descent has been. According to Ruffo, Disney recently called an all-hands meeting where multiple executives and other high-ranking people in the institution talked about what Disney would do going forward to cater to the gay agenda. And lest you think I'm exaggerating or engaging in conspiracy theories with the phrase gay agenda, you should realize that the term was actually used in the meeting. Here's executive producer Latoya Ravineau, uh, and, and here she is, listen. It's like, I love Disney's content. I grew up watching, you know, all of the classics. They have been a huge, like, informative <laughs> part of my life. But at the same time, like, I worked at small studios most of my career, and I'd heard, you know, you hear whispers. Like, I, I'd heard things like, oh, you know, they won't let you show this at a Disney show. And I'm like, okay. So I was a little, like, sus when I started. And, but then my experience was bafflingly the opposite of what I had heard on my little pocket of like, you know, proud family, Disney TVA. Um, the showrunners were super welcoming Meredith Roberts and like the, the, our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my, like not at all secret gay agenda. And so like, I, I feel like I felt like it was, I mean, like maybe it was that way in the past, but I guess like something must have happened in the last, like, like, they're turning it around. They're going hard. Now, uh, she says Disney is going hard on the gay agenda. And no further comment needed. But as bad as that is, and as disturbing is the way she phrased it, still somehow the most troubling thing in that video is that a grown woman is speaking with the language and mannerisms of a 14-year-old on TikTok. But if you're wondering what the gay agenda might look like in practice or sound like, uh, Disney diversity and inclusion manager Vivian Ware appeared later in the meeting to give just one example of how this gay agenda may be put into practice. Listen. Last summer, we, we removed all of the um, gendered greetings in relationship to our live spiels. So we no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we, we've trained, we, we've provided training for all of our, our cast members in, in relationship to that. So now they know it's, it's hello everyone or hello friends. We, we are in the process of changing over those, those recorded messages. And so many of you are probably familiar when we brought the fireworks back to the Magic Kingdom. We no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we say dreamers of all ages. And so I love the fact that it's opened up the creativity, the opportunity for our cast members to look at that. We, we have our cast members working with merchandise, working with food and beverage, working with, with all of our guest facing areas where perhaps, you know, we, we want to create that magical moment with our cast members, with our guests. And we don't want to just assume because someone might be 
um, in, in our interpretation, maybe presenting as female, that they may not want to be called princess. So let's think differently about how do we really engage with our guests in a meaningful and inclusive way that makes it magical and memorable for everyone. Yes, well, we all know that nothing upsets a little girl at Disney World more than being called princess. I mean, they just hate that. Good thing Disney has done away with uh, such slurs. Although, I should warn them that everyone, they said we're going to say everyone instead of ladies and gentlemen. Well, um, that's not going to be an acceptable alternative because everyone implies that each individual identifies as being just a single entity. This could be quite othering to the self-identified theys and thems in the audience, not to mention anybody with disassociative identity disorder. Everyone is not only exclusionary and transphobic, but also ableist. Now, at another point in the meeting, Disney production coordinator Alan March made an appearance where he, he assured the, the assembled staff that his team has created a tracker to ensure that Disney is telling a sufficient number of queer stories. Listen. Yeah, um, I've had the privilege of working with the Moon Girl team for the last two years, and they've been really open to exploring queer stories. And part of, I'm on the production side, uh, part of uh, the work that I feel like I can put in is um, making sure that we take place in modern day New York. So making sure that that's like an accurate reflection of New York. So I put together like a tracker of our background characters to make sure that we have like a, the full breadth of expression. And uh, we got into a very similar conversation, Carrie, of like, oh, all of our like gender non-conforming characters are in the background. And so it's not just a numbers game um, of how many LGBTQ plus characters you have we got the further, uh, the, the more centered a story is on a character, the more nuanced you get to get into their story. And especially with like trans characters, you can't see if someone is trans. There's not one way to look trans. And so kind of the only way to have these like canonical trans characters, canonical asexual characters, canonical bisexual characters is to give them stories where they can like be their whole selves. So this is where you end up when you free fall into woke leftism. You end up using phrases like canonical asexual characters. Although that phrase is not nearly as disturbing as something uttered by Disney corporate president, Carrie Burke. Listen to this. I'm, I'm here as a mother of, of two queer children, actually. Um, uh, one transgender child. Um, um, and one pansexual child, um, and and also as a leader. Um, and that was the thing that really got me because I have heard so much from so many of my colleagues over the course of the last couple of weeks um, in open forums and through emails and phone conversations. And um, I feel a responsibility to speak, um, not just for myself, but for them. Um, to all of us, we, we, had a, we had an open forum last week at 20th where um, again, the home of, of really incredible groundbreaking LGBTQIA stories over the years where um, one of our execs stood up and said, you know, we only have a handful of queer leads in our content. And I went, what? I, that can't be true. And I, and I, and I realized, oh, it, it actually is true. Yes. Um, pansexual child is what she said. Now, please keep this in mind. If your kid is watching Disney content, he is watching content produced by people who believe in the existence of pansexual children. Now, the word pansexual, of course, in reality, means nothing at all. It's nonsense. But according to the left, in their fantasy world, a pansexual is somebody who, quote, is not limited in sexual choice with regard to biological sex, gender, or gender identity. I mean, the story of Peter Pan begins to take on a whole new meaning. And so, Miss Carrie Burke says that there is a, that her that her child, an actual child, is not limited in his sexual choice by biological sex or gender identity. This is how she speaks of children, her own children, and she has two children who are both queer, quote unquote, one pansexual, the other trans. How in God's name do you end up with two children who allegedly identify themselves with these alternative sexual labels? Well, it happens because you select it for them. You hand that identity to them, the way that you might buy a child a new jacket and tell them to put it on. A child is not going to come up with the concept of pansexuality on his own any more than he's going to come up with transgenderism. Those must be given to him. We talk about things being assigned to children. Well, that is assigned. 
He has to be converted into it because, as I've argued many times, the real conversion therapy that happens in our world today is the kind where a child is converted into LGBT. Now, in a normal and in 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 a sane world, the woman in that video would be in prison right now on charges of child abuse. Instead, she's a well-compensated executive at a billion-dollar multimedia company in charge of creating entertainment for children. She also says later in the clip that she wants to have um, half of Disney's characters by the end of the year be LGBT or minorities. Half of them. Now, this would seem to be in conflict with the whole concept of a minority. If the idea is simply representation, then why is there this push for over-representation? Why the insistence on making these identities more prominent on screen than they are in real life? Well, here's the important point. When these people talk about representation, they don't mean that they want the characters and storylines to represent America as it currently is. They want it to represent the kind of world and culture they wish to create. They're not representing culture, they're making it. They want to have a a whole lot more, quote, LGBT children, which means putting a lot more of it on the screen. They want to reshape the world, which means reshaping your child. The only question now is whether you, as a parent, are going to let them do it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Matt Wall Show. If you did, go ahead and hit that subscribe button right down there so you can stay up to date on all of our future content.